This episode is inspired by a suggestion from a listener, William. If you'd like to suggest a topic, you can do so on Facebook and Instagram at Morbid Curiosity Podcast, on Twitter at Morbid Podcast, and on our website, www.morbidcuriositypodcast.com. Humans are fascinated by gore and violence, but even more so the mysterious and unsolved. Interest in these disturbing and unpleasant subjects is called morbid curiosity, and it has gripped millions of people throughout the ages. I am one of those people. My name is Hallie, and this is the Morbid Curiosity Podcast. This final part of our Death in Ancient Egypt series, I'll discuss ancient tomb structures of both non-royal and royal Egyptians, how they changed over time, and how they were built. I'll also discuss who did the building. Listen to the previous two episodes for background information on funerary rites, ideology, and mummification. As mentioned before, I'm not an Egyptologist, but I used texts and articles written by Egyptologists, archaeologists, and other researchers. Still, there was a lot of information to sort through, so as much as I've tried, it's likely I won't get everything correct, especially as I'm summarizing. Thank you for your patience. Because of the ancient Egyptian belief in the afterlife, tombs were considered eternal houses for the Ba and Ka, the spiritual elements of the individual person. Building a tomb was as important as building a house or having a family. Like homes, tombs were built of imperishable materials so they would last as long as possible. Though the makeup of a person's final resting place depended on wealth and status and also changed over time, several things about tombs were the same at all levels of society and throughout Egyptian history. When possible, cemeteries and tombs were located on the west side of the Nile River, as the west was associated with the setting sun and the land of the dead. Cemeteries were also located away from settlements for practical reasons of decay, and also to deter grave robbing. Pre-dynastic Egyptian cultures didn't always follow this, but throughout dynastic Egypt, from about 3000 BCE onward, a firm separation was kept between areas for the dead and areas for the living. Many cemetery locations were also chosen based on religious ideas, such as the cemetery at Abydos, a location thought to be the gateway to the underworld. The location of a burial or tomb within a cemetery also depended on the status of the individual buried inside. Most royal and elite tombs were higher up in the topography of the overall cemetery. However, if the quality of stone was better lower down, this may be reversed. Proximity to the king also indicated status. Often, those in the king's court made sure their position followed them into the afterlife by clearly stating their position multiple times in their tombs. By the 4th dynasty, between about 2575 and 2465 BCE, non-royal people financed their own tombs. Sometimes the pharaoh or king provided land, stone, or laborers. Pharaoh Khufu actually laid out streets of tombs around his pyramid that were allocated to his court officials. This was a very unique occurrence, but similar situations occurred in provincial cemeteries, where the local government carved many simple shaft tombs and then sold them individually. This is similar to the modern process of purchasing cemetery plots. Non-royal tombs evolved separately from royal tombs, though there were some overarching developments as time passed. The earliest tombs were shallow graves dug into the desert sand and gravel, usually marked with a pile of stone and sand on top. There wasn't much difference between noble and common tombs except the funerary equipment inside. As time went on, the size of the tomb and number of grave goods indicated wealth and importance of the individual buried there. 
The first time this was apparent was among the tombs of Abydos from Dynasty Zero, also known as the Nakata III period, which is dated to between 3200 and 3000 BCE. The differences remained very apparent in various forms until the fall of Egypt in 332 BCE. The tombs of non-royal people were not as grandiose as those of the king or the elite members of society, but they still provided an afterlife for the deceased. During the Old Kingdom, only royalty was granted an afterlife, but during the First Intermediate Period, when the power of the pharaoh decreased and the power of the priesthood increased, non-royal people could gain an afterlife if they lived by the principles of Ma'at and built a tomb that provided for it. The graves of the poorest people were shallow holes in the sand or rock. The body was placed in this hollow, usually in a contracted or fetal position. The direction the body faced changed over time, but from the first intermediate period on, they usually faced the east, toward the rising sun. Sometimes a single pottery vessel would accompany them, and sometimes nothing at all. Most tombs, from the middle class to the elite, had an underground substructure and an above-ground superstructure, similar to modern burials, where the coffin is below ground and the headstone is above it. The substructure was usually the burial chamber, while the superstructure functioned as a chapel or offering place where the living could perform the cult of the dead. Listen to part one of this series for more information on the cult of the dead. These chapels were usually decorated with inscriptions and images that were thought to be magical. They included lists of offerings, so that even if physical offerings stopped being made, the deceased would be provided for in the afterlife. Scenes of daily life, life achievements, or religious scenes were also depicted, depending on the time period. There was also usually a small shaft passage from the burial chamber to the surface. This functioned as a transitional area between the world of the living and that of the dead. Sometimes this shaft doubled as the entrance to the burial chamber, while other times it was specifically built for use only by the deceased's spirit. There were two main types of tomb construction, rock-cut and freestanding tombs. Rock-cut tombs were carved into cliff sides or bedrock, while freestanding tombs were built on the surface from mud brick or stone blocks. The burial chamber of both types was usually cut into the bedrock below the superstructure. The type of superstructure usually depended on topography and availability of building material, as well as the wealth of the deceased. Most people were buried in simple, economical shaft tombs. These often had a stela, or offering table, on top of the shaft, but most were just shafts in the bedrock or desert gravel. Some were lined with stone if the ground wasn't solid. These simple tombs weren't generally decorated. For the middle and upper class, the design and layout of the superstructure varied over time and location, but generally, freestanding tombs took the shape of rectangular mastabas, which means bench in Arabic. The mastabas of early dynastic Egypt took the idea that the tomb was a house for the soul very seriously and were laid out just like houses, sometimes even including a toilet. Niches at either end of the rectangle were used as offering places. During the late 3rd early 4th dynasty, around 2650 to 2550 BCE, these niches developed into chapels decorated with images of the deceased, and the house layout was abandoned. By the mid 4th dynasty, these chapels sometimes had many rooms, depending on the wealth of the deceased. False doors were placed in the chapel above where the burial chamber lay. These doors were solid stone and could not be opened, hence the name. The false door became integral to tombs after its appearance. The cult of the dead placed offerings in front of the false door, as it was the interface between the living and the dead. The doors were usually elaborately carved with the deceased's name, titles, and a list of offerings. During the Old Kingdom, which Egyptologists place from about 2649 to 2150 BCE, Another important feature of tombs was the serdab, meaning cellar. This room contained statues of the deceased and statues of people doing daily life tasks, such as grinding grain, brewing beer, and making pottery. These statues were meant as servants for the deceased. Sometimes a larger statue of the deceased was placed in front of a slit in the wall which overlooked the offering space so that they could watch the offerings being made. 
Non-royal tomb structures didn't change much until the end of the 18th dynasty, around 1295 BCE, when temple tombs rose in popularity. These tombs were usually in flat areas and were made up of an enclosed courtyard fronted by a pylon, which led to a chapel with one or more rooms. During the New Kingdom, from about 1550 to 1070 BCE, some temple tombs were topped by a small pyramid. The burial chamber, which was accessible from the chapel or sometimes the courtyard, was usually one room or part of a complex of rooms with galleries, chambers, and shafts, again depending on wealth. Mastabas were also still in use at this time. Rock-cut tombs were used in areas that weren't suitable for mastabas or temple tombs. They were very common in Upper Egypt. The burial chamber was cut into the bedrock, reached by a shaft or sloping passage that was cut either just inside or outside the chapel, which was cut into a cliff face. The tomb was made up of one or more chambers, and the furthest back chamber of the chapel was where the offerings were laid. During the 18th dynasty in Thebes, the religious center of Egypt, the rock-cut tombs became T-shaped, where the base of the T was the focal point of the cult. By the end of the 18th dynasty, more elaborate tombs had reappeared. These had passages, pillared halls, and some descended in a spiral shape toward the burial chamber. Things changed again during the Third Intermediate Period, which began with the 21st dynasty in 1069 BCE. Simplicity became the trend. No chapels, just a shaft and an undecorated burial chamber. In the lower echelons, multiple burials in one tomb became more common, where previously only one burial per tomb was the rule. Grave goods were greatly reduced as well. The reason for these changes was likely a response to a surge in grave robbing, which occurred due to the political upheaval of the Third Intermediate Period. If the burial wasn't rich, perhaps it would be left undisturbed. This minimalist trend continued into the 22nd dynasty, when small chapels reappeared. By the 25th dynasty, monumental tombs made a comeback thanks to the Kushite pharaohs and their fascination with older Egyptian traditions. Their tombs, built in Nubia at Nuri and El Karu, resemble the ancient Egyptian pyramid tombs, but had unique Nubian architecture. To learn more about these tombs, listen to our episode on the pyramids of Nubia. In Thebes, vast funerary palaces were built for the most elite, both freestanding and rock-cut. In the Delta, a unique style developed, where the superstructure was a square with multiple niches and many false doors and offering places. Inside, a huge shaft led to a small but elaborately decorated burial chamber. This shaft was then filled with sand to prevent grave robbing. In the late period, beginning in 664 BCE, tomb size and shape was incredibly variable. Elite tombs could be mastabas or temple tombs. During this time, communal catacombs appeared, and these continued into the Greco-Roman period. These catacombs were large family tombs with many niches for bodies to be placed in. Throughout dynastic Egypt, grave goods accompanied the deceased into the tomb. Wealth determined the number of objects that would be placed there, and what was essential changed over time. In summary, essentials included provisions to feed the deceased in the afterlife, usually stored in vessels of stone, clay, or precious metals. Pyramid texts, then coffin texts, and then the Book of the Dead were essential to guide the deceased to the afterlife, and amulets were essential to protect them. I spoke in detail about both of these in previous parts of this series. Many times, servant statues were included, or later, after the 12th dynasty, Shabtis. Shabtis are small figurines in the shape of mummies that were made specifically to function as servants or workers for the deceased in the afterlife. Coffins began as special objects reserved for the rich, but by the 19th dynasty, even the lowest levels of society had wooden coffins, albeit plain, box-shaped ones. The famous nesting anthropoid coffins, made of painted wood, which fit inside one another and then inside an even larger stone sarcophagi, were exclusive to the nobility and royalty. Sometimes furniture that had been used during life, or specially made mortuary furniture, was placed in the tomb. A whole mortuary industry blossomed at the end of the Old Kingdom in order to provide these specially made items. The industry rose and fell with tomb trends and was sometimes supplied by looters. 
Looting of Egyptian tombs has been around since grave goods were first added to tombs in the earliest days of the practice. Most monumental tombs were looted in ancient times, long before antiquarians and archaeologists found them. Sometimes the deceased were robbed even before they were placed in the tomb, with the embalmers taking things off the mummy as they wrapped it. Tomb builders were also often the culprits. These stolen objects were then sold off for other burials. Sometimes not only objects were stolen, but the tomb itself. The original occupant was moved, a new mummy placed inside, and that new person's name carved over the old occupants. Other times, the stone blocks of a freestanding tomb might be usurped to build a completely new tomb. Even coffins were sometimes stolen and reused. Papyrus records of the trials of tomb robbers give vivid descriptions of their deeds, which often included desecrating the mummy to ensure the deceased had no afterlife. Punishments for tomb robbers were severe and included torture, disfigurement, impalement, and name erasure, which denied them personhood and their own chance at an afterlife. Despite these harsh punishments, tomb robbing continued throughout Egyptian history. Trends in burial and tomb technology changed in response to tomb robbing activity, with spikes in more simple, hidden tombs during periods of instability, when cemeteries weren't as carefully guarded and wealth was scarce. The pharaohs of the 21st dynasty in the New Kingdom were so worried about tomb robbers that after a large funeral, their bodies and grave goods were moved to discreet and inaccessible tombs, such as the rock-cut tombs in the Valley of the Kings. This is how King Tutankhamun's tomb avoided looting, and was therefore full of treasure when Howard Carter opened it in 1922. Tomb robbery increased in the 16th century, and again in the 19th century, with European tourism in Egypt, with robbers making large profits from selling tomb goods to tourists. Archaeological excavations weren't as careful as they are now, and focused mainly on the treasure, not the mummy or the tomb itself so a lot of information was lost due to destruction. Modern archaeologists still seek undisturbed tombs, but emphasis is no longer on the treasure, but what the entire tomb can tell us about the ancient Egyptians. While non-royal tombs were sometimes targeted by grave robbers, royal tombs were the main focus of thieves due to the masses of precious objects sealed inside them. Before I get into royal tombs and the treasures contained in them, Let's pause for a word from our sponsors. Our regular sponsor is Audible.com. Audible can provide you with interesting and engaging audiobooks. In fact, there are over 180,000 of them to choose from, which you can listen to on your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or other MP3 players. MCP listeners can get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial of Audible.com by going to www.audibletrial.com mcp. You can also find this link on our Facebook page and website. If you sign up for the free trial, you get a free audiobook that is yours to keep, even if you cancel the service as soon as you finish downloading it. And the MCP gets the funding it needs to keep bringing morbid history to your ears. So go get your free audiobook on us. Lastly, if you like this podcast, why not sponsor the MCP yourself by becoming a patron on Patreon? Over 45,000 people download this podcast every month, but only around 140 people are supporting us on Patreon. For a mere dollar an episode, you can get ad-free episodes, bonus behind-the-scenes info, give your opinion by answering polls, have access to all the horror story readings, and get updates on past episodes. For $3 an episode, you get monthly outtake reels. For $5, you get a monthly quiz episode, where I quiz my husband on past episodes. For $10, you get a detailed bibliography of all the resources I've used while researching an episode. And for $20, you get a bit of miscellaneous morbidity, a short essay on a random morbid topic every month. Previously, we have reviewed horror video games and television shows, and tried out historic recipes from previous episodes. All of these rewards aside, your patronage supports the podcast and keeps new episodes coming. Things on Patreon will be changing soon. There's going to be a content increase. The MCP will be going back to our regular schedule of two episodes a month for our amazing patrons. To make things easier, we'll be charging per month instead of per episode. The price per episode stays the same, and more content will be posted.
Also, many of the older episodes will become exclusive to patrons. Existing patrons will need to switch to these new content-rich tiers to make sure they receive their exclusive rewards. The rest of the creepy community will still have access to one free episode per month, some of which will be updates of these older episodes. This way, you all still get new episodes, and patrons get the exclusive content they've paid for. I can't keep doing this podcast without you, so go to bit.ly slash morbidpatron, that's b-i-t dot l-y slash morbidpatron, to choose your rewards and support the MCP. You'll have my eternal gratitude. And now, back to the podcast. Ancient Egyptian royal tombs evolved separately from non-royal tombs, though elite tombs often imitated them, especially during periods of upheaval. The largest and most recognizable examples of royal tombs are pyramids, but pyramids weren't actually the most common type of royal tomb. Some of the oldest royal tombs were multi-roomed subterranean structures made of mud brick, reed mats lined the walls, and a gravel mound was raised over the structure. They were sometimes marked by a pair of stelae emblazoned with the name of the pharaoh. Nearby mudbrick structures were likely used as chapels for the mortuary cult. The servants of the early pharaohs were often laid out in orderly rows around them, and it's theorized that they were buried around the same time. It's not known if they volunteered to die with their ruler or were forcibly killed to accompany him to the afterlife. Either way, this practice ended before the Old Kingdom began. The first stone pyramid wasn't built until the Third Dynasty. It was built by King Djoser at Saqqara. It began as a square mastaba, but was expanded in height and width to form a step pyramid with six steps. Beneath the pyramid were several burial chambers for the royal family, as well as several other chambers for funerary goods. A walled funerary complex surrounded the pyramid and included a temple to the north of the structure and a symbolic tomb, or cenotaph, to the south. The first true pyramid was built by Pharaoh Sneferu during the 4th dynasty. In fact, three pyramids are attributed to him, the Medum Pyramid at Medum and the Bent Pyramid and Red Pyramid at Dashur. His pyramids introduced major innovation in design and construction, and you can actually see the evolution from step pyramid to true pyramid in these constructions. The most famous pyramids are the three immense pyramids of Giza, the largest being the Great Pyramid of Khufu, who ruled after Sneferu. The Great Pyramid is 750 by 750 feet at the base, or 230.4 by 230.4 meters and is 455.2 feet, or 138.7 meters tall. Previously, it was 481 feet, or 147 meters tall, but the pyramidion that formed the very top and the original white limestone outer casing of the pyramid have been completely lost due to reuse of the stone. However, the lack of the outer casing gives a view of how the pyramid was built using roughly hewn limestone blocks stacked in small steps. These were quarried nearby and dragged into place using ramps and sleds and thousands of workers. The casing stones were originally polished so that they shone brightly in the sun. The pyramidion on top might have been covered in gold, but there's no archaeological evidence of this. Shiny metal or not, the pyramid would have caught the sun's rays in an impressive and blinding flash that was likely visible for miles. The inner corridors and chambers have walls and ceilings made of polished granite, one of the hardest stones known in Khufu's time. The interior was entered from the north and included three chambers. The top chamber, built into the pyramid itself, was the burial chamber of Khufu, In the middle was the statue chamber, erroneously called the Queen's Chamber upon discovery, and under the foundations is a mysterious, unfinished subterranean chamber. Galleries and shafts lead to all three chambers. 
All three pyramids of Giza include an enormous complex of other buildings around them, the likes of which had never been seen previously. The Great Pyramid Complex included a valley temple linked to the Nile by a canal, a covered causeway leading from the valley temple to a mortuary temple on the east side of the pyramid, an enclosure wall which encased several boats buried in their own sort of tombs, and a cenotaph. The tombs of the royal family and priests were also included within the complex, as well as the Sphinx. Pyramid tombs were only used by royalty until the end of the Second Intermediate Period, around 1630 BCE. However, their construction during that time waxed and waned as well. Hardly any monumental structures were built during the First Intermediate Period, and that included tombs. During this time, Egypt was split into two kingdoms, with capitals in Heracleopolis in the north and Thebes in the south. Around 1980 BCE, during the second part of the 11th dynasty, which is also the beginning of the Middle Kingdom, pyramids began to be used once more, as the pharaoh had regained control over the whole of Egypt. Pharaoh Mentuhotep II combined his tomb and mortuary temple with temples for the sun god Amun-Re to legitimize his rule through association with the god. His tomb was a platform approached by ramps and surmounted by a small pyramid. This was then surrounded by a colonnade. The burial chamber was accessed through a rear sloping passage that led deep into the mountains at Deir el-Bahari. New pyramid technology also developed, including false passageways, dead-end tunnels, and massive stone portcullises to try and thwart thieves. During the 12th dynasty, pyramids were common royal tombs in the north of Egypt. An example of these is the Pyramid of Senusret II, known as the Elahun Pyramid in Fayoum, Egypt. This pyramid has been worn down by time, as it was built of mud brick, which is not as solid or strong as stone. However, inside the burial chamber were many artifacts, including stone sarcophagi and several mummies in brightly painted wooden coffins. During the Second Intermediate Period, the Hyksos of West Asia invaded Egypt. No tombs are known for any ruling Hyksos kings, who made up the 15th dynasty of Egypt. This dynasty didn't control the entire land, however. An Egyptian 16th dynasty ruled the south of Egypt from Thebes. A third dynasty, referred to as the Abydos dynasty, also ruled at the same time. Their tombs are at Abydos, next to the kings of the Middle Kingdom. King Warserebre Senebke's tomb is a good example. All that remains today are the four inner chambers, one of which was a painted limestone burial chamber. The decoration, however, was not finished. The limestone was also pillaged from another tomb, as the carved decoration from the previous owner is still apparent on some stones, despite efforts to sand it down. During the 17th dynasty, which was the last dynasty of the Second Intermediate Period, the royal tombs at Thebes were marked by mud-brick pyramids. The substructures were substantial yet simple. The last pyramid was built for Pharaoh Amos I of the 18th dynasty at Abydos, it's unknown, however, if the pyramid is an actual tomb or cenotaph. After Amos I, pharaohs were buried in hidden rock-cut tombs in the Valley of the Kings, near Thebes. These tombs were carved into the cliffs of the valley and were often quite simple in design. The mortuary temples were far away from the tombs, at the margins of the desert. They were combined temples to the pharaoh and the sun god Amun-Re, once again to emphasize the king's connection with the gods. Both tomb and temple were highly decorated. The hope was that having the tomb hidden and the cult temple far away would deter grave robbers. Most of the 18th dynasty royal tombs were similar until the reign of Pharaoh Akhenaten. Akhenaten did many things differently, such as honoring one god, a new sun god named Aten, above all others, removing Osiris from much of the funerary traditions, and moving the capital and royal cemetery to Amarna. Not much is known of the funerary customs. They don't appear to have changed at all except for the exclusion of Osiris. However, all tombs included scenes of Akhenaten adoring the sun. The individual buried in the tomb seems to be secondary to the king and his god. The Amarna period is quite interesting in general. Let me know if you want an episode about it. After Akhenaten, royal tombs once again were located in the Valley of the Kings. They became more and more simple in construction, but far more decorated. They were also less concerned with security. 
By the end of the New Kingdom, about 1075 BCE, the valley was abandoned as a royal cemetery. Royal tombs moved to Tanis, or Saqqara, with a chapel structure on the surface and simple stone subterranean burial chambers, usually inside the Temple of Amun. The exception to this was the 25th dynasty of Nubian kings, which I already mentioned. After the Nubian kings, royal burials became quite varied. Huge, undecorated shaft tombs are found at Saqqara, while wide but shallow tombs are found at Heliopolis. In Thebes, rock-cut tombs were favored and highly decorated. Grave goods became scarce, and communal burials, even for royalty, became common. The tombs of the rulers during the Greco-Roman period have yet to be discovered. As the Greeks cremated their dead, it's possible no tombs exist for the kings of this period. The age of the pharaohs and their monumental tombs was over. Unlike non-royal tombs, which were paid for by the individual or their family, royal tombs were paid for by the state. In fact, taxes may have been paid in the form of labor for tomb building. Farmers often joined the building crews during the four months in which the agricultural fields lay fallow due to the annual flooding of the Nile. In this way, royal tomb construction provided temporary employment, helped people avoid monetary taxes, and was also seen as an act of piety in accordance with Ma'at. The builders also got food, shelter, and clothing during their time on the project. During the New Kingdom, this changed. As the tombs were kept hidden, only specialists were brought in to do the work, as this made it less likely that the tomb would be robbed. This didn't work, however, as many tombs were still robbed, not long after the burials. The traditional theory is that slaves built the tombs of the pharaohs, but there is a large amount of evidence in the form of papyri work lists and administrative documents showing that this was not true. Specialized artisans were contracted to build most of the royal tombs. They were assisted by non-specialized laborers who quarried and moved stone, prepared the work sites, and did other tasks. The artisans were in charge of teams or crews of laborers. These teams had names, such as Friends of Khufu and Drunkards of Menkaure. These teams worked in shifts. Usually, two teams carved each section of the tomb, one for each half. Both rock-cut and freestanding tombs began as rough-hewn, and then the walls were smoothed out. The same tools were used for any type of tomb. Wooden and stone hammers were common, as well as chisels made of a copper-bronze alloy. The shape of the tomb was laid out using simple measuring tools, such as string and cubits. These measurements were marked in red ink, and the markings can still be seen on the ceiling and walls of some tombs. A separate crew was in charge of decoration. A rough grid was laid out on the walls in red ink. Then a chief draftsman made edits in black ink. The decoration would then proceed, either carving and then painting, or just painting. Most workers lived near the building site. Archaeological excavation of these sites has given us most of the information we have on the workers. Workers' villages have been excavated at Giza, Lahun, and Deir el Medina. The Giza Builders Cemetery especially has revealed a lot of information about work-related accidents, such as broken limbs and crushed toes. These injuries were mostly healed, which suggests there was a medical team on hand as well. The workers were also well-fed, and sometimes paid in land grants from the pharaoh. If you're interested in learning more about Egyptian tombs and the people who built them, I recommend reading Ancient Egyptian Tombs, The Culture of Life and Death by Stephen Snape, or The Complete Pyramids, Solving the Ancient Mysteries by Mark Lenner. Why are we still so obsessed with ancient Egypt? I believe it's partly because they left so much behind, tombs, temples, and texts, yet they remain mysterious. It may also be because so much has been preserved by the desert and the ancient embalmers that it's as if in death they achieved the immortality they so desperately sought in life. As humans continue to this day to seek ways of extending their own lives, to gain immortality, to escape death, the fact that the Egyptians sort of achieved this fascinates us, igniting the spark of curiosity into a fire of research and exploration. The 
Morbid Curiosity Podcast was produced by H. Lloyd. If you'd like to get in touch or suggest a morbid topic for me to talk about, you can tweet the show at Morbid Podcast or find us on Facebook and Instagram at Morbid Curiosity Podcast. If you like the show, please share us on social media and please give us a rating on Apple Podcasts or whatever podcast app you use. Your shares and ratings help us expand this wonderfully creepy community. Thank you to everyone who liked, commented, followed, and shared the MCP on social media. Killian, Alex N, Liz M, G, Georgia W, Melissa B, and Sarah B all have my eternal gratitude for becoming patrons. Thank you so much. Thank you to whoever sent the book about ancient African civilizations to our P.O. box. Your name wasn't on the package, so I hope you hear this and let me know it was you. Because of you, the listeners, our creepy community is growing, especially on Facebook, so head over there to engage with other listeners, discuss episodes, suggest topics, and share your own morbid curiosities. The MCP has joined the Straight Up Strange Podcast Network, which hosts true crime, paranormal, history, science, folklore, and other enigmatic podcasts. Nothing is off limits when you enter the world of Straight Up Strange. The MCP is also part of a wider creepy community known as the Belfry Podcast Network. Check out other shows on the Belfry Network at www.thebelfry.rip. If you want to support the MCP but would rather not become a patron on Patreon, you can give one-time donations by going to our website, www.morbidcuriositypodcast.com, and clicking the Donate button. Also on our website, you'll find links to all our social media, a list of episodes, and other ways to contact us, including our mailing address. Another way to help the show is by visiting our Amazon wishlist at bit.ly slash morbidwishlist. That's B-I-T dot L-Y slash morbidwishlist. Any purchases from this list are greatly appreciated. We are eternally grateful for your support. My name is Hallie, and until next time, thanks for listening.